I realized that most of the specimens that are kept in fluid, ethanol or formalin, it gets to a point that it discolors the specimen. So is there any other preservative aside from these two? Okay. Or we have to refill them for I'm, some time. I'm sure certain, the fluid are yeah. there. I'm certainly not an expert with, with fluid preserved specimens, but to my knowledge, ethanol is the fluid of choice. There is, when there's really serious discoloration, you can change the ethanol. And perpetually, we're topping off you know, to make sure that the fluid level doesn't go too low. Um, that discoloration goes hand in hand also with loss of coloration from um, essentially the living animal. So as you take, let's say, a brightly colored fish and inject it up with formalin or with, with ethanol, and then it's preserved for a day, a week, a month, a year, its colors fade. And in fact, the same thing happens with, with bird bills and bird legs, where those colors do degrade over time. It's something that's not completely permanent. So what we do, traditionally in ornithology, and I think you know, in each of the vertebrate classes, is a handwritten description of the colors, which is not terribly useful, okay, in that I may see it, I may be red-green colorblind, and so I may say, you know, the bill is gray, and it was actually pink, okay? But more recently, what a lot of collections are doing is to take a high-quality uh, digital image of the bird or mammal or whatever in life, or recently dead, and link that photograph permanently with the specimen. So there you have a situation where in our database goes a link to a bird maybe sitting up on the hand before it's sacrificed. So it increases the complexity. <coughs> Just before I came on this trip, I transferred about two gigabytes of photographs to our collections manager from our last ex my last expedition in, in Mongolia in the, desert, in the Gobi Desert. And it was an image of every single bird that we collected, either alive or recently dead. And for most of the birds, it was images of the habitat where the bird was collected. So you get into a lot of complexity as far as managing the uh, the digital objects that are attached to a specimen. So this kind of goes back to Moses's situation where you have your main database that creates occurrence IDs and then you have a separate database that links occurrence ID to some photo ID. And ideally the photo ID is some permanent identifier, a DOI, that sort of thing. So you get into a lot of complexity quickly, okay? Is this for me or for Christiane? It's fine. Hi. As you were presenting, I noted something about fluid specimens. It's something that we also use. We are always topping them up with alcohol. Um, and recently we topped out our term, termite collection with alcohol. And I wanted to find out there are different kinds of uh, alcohol that you can use for the collection. Yeah. Is there any problem if you change and top up with a different kind? Well, it depends on um, if you're concerned about the actual specimen and the pr preservation of the specimen, yes. or if you're cons more concerned about maybe preserving the DNA in the specimen. I would say if you're con primarily concerned about keeping the specimen in good shape for you know, occurrence data, morphological exploration, whatever, um, it's not a really big deal. So what I, what you, you know, obviously what you would find a lot is that people would, let's say, collect into, in the past, they would have collected into 70% ethanol. And over time, ethanol evaporates. So by the time you might look back into that vial, the ethanol really might be only 50% or so. And then 
in a, in a way, it really doesn't matter too much, like how high percentage you're adding to that. There are certain, there are certain exceptions. So if you have a really low ethanol preserved specimen and you top it up with tons of really like 100% ethanol essentially, that means it will shrivel up really quite badly. So in order to transfer really low percentage ethanol specimens into higher, much higher percentage ethanols, we typically go through ethanol, um, how do you call it, ethanol steps. Stepping it up. Stepping it up, yeah, exactly. Um, for, and this is for, you know, for really fragile things. But then, you know, mostly you wouldn't really go up to 90, 80% or 100% anyway, because whatever has been for a longer period of time and as low as, you know, below 70, most likely the DNA is not going to be good enough to do any molecular work with them. So the higher than 70% ethanol really comes in where you're interested in, you know, keeping the specimen such that you could do, let's say, if you're interested in barcoding or in any type of molecular work to, do, to be done in the future. That's a really important consideration, obviously. The higher percentage the ethanol, the better for these kind of things. Um, and also, I noticed in the past um, that the price of ethanol and you know, these, like, well, it's essentially medical grade ethanol, it's really high percentage ethanol, it varies a lot from country to country. And I remember in Nigeria a few years ago, we paid an absolute fortune for just a few bottles, relatively small bottles of high percentage ethanol. So we were very concerned about only putting very important research specimens into this high percentage ethanol. And then for other specimens, we used lower grade. But then also I noticed during the visit in, in Cameroon last year that the prices actually, or maybe it's a difference between the countries, the ethanol seems to have become much cheaper overall. So it really wasn't that much of a concern. You're in much better luck in many Central and South American countries. You can just go to a pharmacy and buy 100% or 95% ethanol that definitely is perfect for any DNA study. And it costs like you know, five or six dollars per relatively big bottle. So it's really cheap compared to that. So in those countries, obviously, we just, you know, we carry a lot of that with us. So there's one other thing, and um, this is actually, it's a pretty sad story <laughs> in a way. It's not a completely resolved story yet either, but um, other than um, ethyl, um, ethyl ethanol, ethyl, ethyl alcohol, ethyl, 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 ethyl alcohol, yeah. There's also, um, what is that other alcohol called? Iso no, it's not methanol, it's iso something. That's, that's what I'm asking. Oh, isopropyl alcohol, thank you. I always, you know, you, the common names for those things are different in German than they're in English. And <laughs> my chemistry has been a long time ago. I was taught in German, so. <laughs> okay, isopropyl ethanol. Mm -hmm. So some collections had, and I just learned that you're doing a recent visit to the Florida State Collection of um, arthropods. They essentially had a spigot on a sink that was um, connected to a big vat of isopropyl ethanol and whatever specimens, they had a lot of bulk samples coming in, ethanol preserved bulk samples coming in over time. So it comes in these little plastic roll packs and then they transfer it into bigger jars and then it topped it off with that isopropyl ethanol. And from what we know at the moment, isopropyl ethanol really doesn't go well with DNA extractions. So potentially with whatever they've been topping up over the last, so they changed fairly recently only, over the last 20 years, it might not be good enough material to do any molecular studies with them, which for a lot of people in insect world starts becoming an, an issue. So you get more enthusiasm out of researchers if specimens can be used for everything, you know, for occurrence data, morphological studies, but then also molecular studies. And that could be at the species level, phylogeographic studies often need fresh and a lot of fresh material. And you need to get some molecular markers out of them um, as well for big phylogenetic studies. It's really important. So mm -hmm. essentially ethanol is, ethanol is the way to go if you're looking for the highest quality um, um, specimen preservation really in, in insects, you want to go for 95% ethanol, 95 to 90, you know, 99, whatever the closest is you can get to 100. Um, if micro stuff is not a priority, lower is okay as well, but if there's any way you could get them. 
I wouldn't also I wouldn't worry about transferring older material that had been stored under that's another it's a whole other story the whole the way you're storing your specimens but if you had specimens sitting in 70 percent and lower there's really no sense in transferring it to a higher percentage later on because the DNA preservation really happens during the early stages if you catch the insect you dump it in ethanol and it really the 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 fastness with which it will be, uh, the speed with which it will be preserved really depends on how much water is in that initial set of ethanol really. So if there's too much water in that, which means the percentage of the ethanol is too low grade, there will be some deterioration of the DNA versus if you get them, collect them in high percentage, you keep that. The storage thing I was mentioning, and this is another big concern too, is that when we collect our um, our research specimens in a field, we try to obviously get them in high percentage ethanol and we try to keep them as cool as possible, which is you know, something, obviously you go in the field and you know, most of the time it's not really possible um, to do that. There are certain ways of dealing with that. So some colleagues, for example, take extra ethanol with them. They say, okay, you collect the specimens, you put them in vials, and then a couple of days later, or even a day later or so, you transfer them to a new set of ethanol vials. Um, if you have access to a fridge or a freezer, um, I went to a research station in French Guyane, which is out in the middle of nowhere. It's a full day boat trip to get there. If you have a lot of money, you can go there by helicopter. We didn't have a lot of money, <laughs> so <laughs> it was a long trip. And um, they have a generator, and because they're helicoptering and boating in a lot of the food, there's typically a lot of people on a research station, they do actually have a bunch of freezers. So we were allowed a little bit of space in these freezers to keep our specimens in there. And that was a pretty exceptional thing to happen, but you know, sometimes you can do that. And then also typically when we, there's more complication in there too, because we go collect, we want to take the specimens back to our lab to actually work with them before we then repatriate um, specimens to their country of origin and they're curated and prepared and all that. But the problem with that is when you go on a plane, you can't take big quantities of ethanol with you on a plane because plane companies don't like that, obviously. So we go through the whole pain of actually transferring specimens into propylene glycol which is, it's antifreeze. So you can get uh, really, really cheaply for no money at all, pretty much. Um, and it's very good actually for DNA preservation as well. And it's, it's, a, it's a gooey fluid. It's like glycerol. It's not quite as bad as glycerol, but it's clo close enough, really. So it also um, buffers the specimens in a way. So they, in, in ethanol, they would be shaking around like that while they're in, in, in transit, essentially, and when you do that um, with the propylene glycol, they are quite protected because the, the fluid is so viscous that small specimens in particular, they don't float around, don't break as easily. And then when we come back home, we transfer them back into ethanol and then we stick them into the freezer, essentially. So it's, it's quite a process. And again, you can't, well, can't really do that for super huge projects, but for the type of research projects we're focusing on, that's quite important. So this isopropyl <coughs> alcohol that I poured into ethanol, it means I can't use the specimens for DNA? That's the thing. So this is what people tell you, but there's a lot of black box stuff out there and there's a lot of hearsay and I tried it once and it didn't work and now I tell everyone that you know don't even bother trying to extract DNA for specimens like that. <laughs> and after I went to the Florida State Collection and they told me, don't even bother, this is how we've been treating all the specimens. We're just starting, we just started to bring the specimens back to our, to our lab and we will try because, you know, there's, it's not a costly to actually try. So I wouldn't say it, it's, it's an absolutely, you know, lost cause, but, you know, it's one of the things for the future. <coughs> if there's any ways of working around issues like that, obviously it's a good thing. But you know, whatever has been collected, you have to make the most out of it. And in our case too, for those specimens, um, we're doing a big project with the Field Museum. A lot of their material is very old. It's definitely 70% ethanol, so we will not be able to get DNA out of a lot of these specimens. But they're still extremely useful specimens, and we're going to be 
using them for the taxonomic project. We have big mon um, our phylogenies are typically morphological as well as molecular. So obviously these specimens can still be used for a lot of things. So. Okay, 